the interdisciplinary center at Herzliya. And I'm going to talk a bit about the type of things that I'm doing. I'm doing a whole bunch of things, but I'm going to try to focus it on kind of the main, the main theme and uh, the tutorial and research talks that I'm going to give in the short and long program are kind of extensions of this brief introduction. So the main uh, kind of thing that I think ties all of my research is this attempt to try to understand how evolution and population history affect genome sequence variation. This is kind of the main uh, objective of population genetics in general, and one of the main reasons that we're interested in this kind of process is that we can, so that we can draw inferences by looking at genome sequences and trying to kind of understand our population history. And there are kind of two general things that we'd want to learn from genome sequence variation. Is there a way maybe to turn these off? Yeah, I guess one, one thing I guess that we should all keep in mind is that, yeah, light slides are better than dark slides. <laughs> um, so we'd want to make these inferences, and the two main things we want to learn are, one is just the demographic history, how these populations uh, kind of uh, spread and evolve their sizes and uh, the times at which the, they split and gene flow between populations, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about that. Another thing is how natural selection affects, uh, affects variation. That is how, that's obviously the thing that uh, we, can, we can then use these genome sequence variation signals to understand a bit more about function of these uh, different genomic regions. So a lot of people are doing population genetics, and I think the one thing um, that we do a bit kind of differently than what most people do is that we always try to think about these genetic genealogies in the middle. In a, Hopefully, you'll understand what this means in about five minutes. So what's a genealogy? I think most of you probably know. It's kind of this nice graphic structure that helps us uh, describe how we're all related. And here you see uh, the genealogy of Charles Darwin and uh, his wife. And you see kind of all of their offspring and uh, ancestors. And it's kind of a, a lot of these components tend to be kind of connected, especially here because Darwin was married to his uh, first cousin, and you have a lot of these links. So in, in most real-life genealogies, you're going to have these links. They're not always going to be one or two generations back, but you are going to see kind of these lineages merging, and these are the kind of th signals that we're looking for in the genetic data. So this is, you know, actual genealogies that we can draw from historical records. They don't tend to be very deep or very wide. But if you think about genetic genealogies, they can be uh, hundreds, thousands of years uh, deep and very, very wide. So what's a genetic genealogy? Now try to think about, before we get into kind of genetic geneal genealogy, try to think about kind of the concept of genealogy in general. So if you're situated here, this is kind of your person of interest, then the genealogy is a tree structure that goes back in time, right? We all, each, every one of us has two parents and four grandparents and eight great-grandparents. And you, as we go back in time, we see these uh, kind of lineages starting to merge because at one point we kind of have these uh, separate lineages that uh, uh, merge at common ancestors. So it's not really a tree, it's kind of a graph structure going back in time. So what can we learn? So now, say that you have this genealogy at hand for some person of interest. It has a lot of, this genealogy has a lot of very useful information about population history. So if this is your individual here and uh, he or she belongs to this population, then by looking at the genetic genealogy, we can see traces of a lot of kind of demographic 
uh, events that happened in the ancestral population. For instance, if there was kind of this sharp decrease in population size, then what you will see in the genealogy, you will see kind of this excess of these merging, these coalescent events. Because again, there are not many individuals in this kind of strip of time. You don't have a lot of individuals in the population and the lineages just have to merge because they don't, they, you don't have many individuals to act as, as parents. So if you just trace kind of these coalescent events, just by their rates, you can kind of uh, get read off of population sizes going back in time. And a lot of population genetic inference that looks at population sizes, it actually tries to do this. It tries to kind of trace the rate of coalescent events going back in time. Even, even if you don't see any genealogy kind of in, in, in the drawing, it's always there in the background. So with one population, that's pretty much as much as you can get. But if you now look at uh, multiple individuals from different populations, uh, it becomes more interesting. So you get access to this information of, on population sizes from these coalescent events. But from the structure of the coalescent events, for instance, coalescences between ancestors of this individual and ancestors of this individual, you can kind of understand when these populations split back in time, right? You see that beyond this point and downwards, you don't see any coalescences. So that gives you information about uh, the population split time. And here you see more recent coalescences between these two individuals. So you understand that their populations are more closely related. Uh, but obviously this can be because you know, most populations are not, do not behave in complete isolation. Then you have these kind of uh, gene flow, uh, you have gene flow between populations, which I here designate by this, what I call migration bands. So there are the, like these horizontal br uh, branches in this population tree that allow lineages to cross at some low rate between two distinct populations. So, <clears throat> so you're gonna have to, if you really want to understand population history, you're gonna have to assume a somewhat complex model that allows these divergence and gene flow events and tries to uh, explain the coalescent events that you see in this genealogy by using the kind of demographic parameters in this model. So that's the main thing that I've, that's w whenever I try to think about population genetic inference from genetic data, I try to see what, what, what are we actually learning about the genetic genealogy underlying uh, our data. So, so I haven't talked at all about genetics until now. So where do we get the signal about genealogy from genetics? So now say you have these three individuals, Alice, Bob, and Charles, and you have access to their genomes. So the idea is that at a particular site in the genome, and you have these genomes aligned, obviously. So uh, at a particular site, uh, the genomes are related using a specific tree going back in time. So this tree is like a subgraph of your big genealogy, and you get it by going back in time. And every node where you have a split into two branches, a maternal and paternal branch, then you decide which side you go based on the mode of inheritance in that generation, whether this site was inherited from the mother or from the father. So you get kind of a single lineage going back in time from each individual, and these lineages merge in these two, uh, in these two ancestors here, and you get a tree for this particular site. So this tree is going to be the tree not only for this site, but probably for like a collection of sites around that site. And then at some point, say here and here, you're going to have recombination events. These, rec these ancestral recombination events, what they mean, for instance, let's look at what happened around here. So around here, what happened is that in this individual, from the right, from the portion of the genome to the right of this uh, line, uh, this individual inherited from, say, uh, their mother, which was on this side, and that's why you get this tree. But on this side of, uh, in this side of this line, the same individual inherited it from uh, their father, which uh, corresponds to this lineage here, and then it coalesced at this point. So the segment of the genome here is going to have this tree 
the segment here is going to have this tree and, and here you have another recombination event. It's this event here and you're going to get a different tree to the right of this point. So if you think about it as you go along the genome, these, this, the tree, the local, what I call the local genealogy, which is kind of the subtree of the big genealogy, is kind of going to flip around using these uh, kind of subtree pruning and grafting operation that Elron also mentioned for, for bacteria. So it's kind of the same kind of process. So even in, in uh, eukary eukaryotic, gene, uh, eu eukaryotic genomes, you get a shift in your gene trees, but not because you have horizontal gene transfer, but because the trees are actually different. And if a lot of these coalescent events are or ancestral, in ancestral population, you're going to actually get very different trees in very different parts of the genome. And the idea is to use this variation to learn something about population history. This is what we're trying to do. So this big structure that kind of conveys all of this information, the, the local genealogies and how they change, it's called the ancestral recombination graph, or the ARG. And I think we're going to, you're going to see different talks kind of mentioning maybe not mentioning specifically the name, but I think you are going to see uh, kind of more instantiations of this ARG uh, uh, during, uh, during uh, CGSI. And this is something that, again, I try to think when I'm doing this type of inference and I'm trying to think about the genetic genealogy in the middle, it's actually this ARG. So I'm trying to think about the ARG and what features of the ARG I can extract in order to learn something about population history. So this is kind of the main overarching theme of my research. I'm going to show you a few examples of things that we've been doing and things that we're now engaged in, and uh, hopefully then we can have some more discussions offline. Uh, so one thing that, I've, uh, that I did during my postdoc at Cornell is develop, try to use, again, this framework to develop a method to actually do inference of these uh, demographic histories this method is called GFOX. I'm going to talk a bit more about it in my tutorial talk on Monday, so I don't want to say too much. But the main idea there is that we don't actually look at this very complex structure of how these genealogies change. We just restrict our view to these short, unlinked loci along the genome and assume that these genealogies are independent. That makes it a whole lot easier to deal with. Uh, with these types of uh, Bayesian inference uh, methods. And then we sample these genealogies to get information about the uh, demographic parameters in the model. So that's one uh, thing uh, that we're doing. And this is uh, something that uh, was actually developed by another postdoc in, uh, in Adam's lab. Uh, but we're using it as well, is kind of a way to again, use the complete model of this ancestral combination graph and how these trees change along the genome, but we can't really use it to do demography inference, but we can, we can infer these, uh, we can do probabilistic inference of this ARG and then use that inference to do kind of post-analysis and learn something about genetics. I'm going to mention this maybe a bit in my research talk. So just to show you that it's really useful, it's not just a theoretical idea. So we have now quite a lot of studies that use uh, this uh, approach, this GFOX method to do demography inference. And this is one that I'm uh, really fond of uh, from 2014, where we uh, took in collaboration with uh, John of Umbra and uh, uh, Robert Wayne from uh, UCLA, uh, we took uh, a bunch of uh, dog genomes and wolf genomes where the wolves were sampled from different places around the globe, from East Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. And we tried to answer the very basic question of where, where dogs were domesticated from, where, where the ancestral kind of lineage of all dogs, where did it originate? Because there were very different hypotheses. Uh, some people thought it came from East Asia, other from the Middle East. And we wanted to kind of settle that idea using a really complex and explicit model. And uh, we were able to use GFOX to kind of infer this demography. And, it's, and the nice thing about it is that it turned pretty complex. And we saw that a lot of the signals that people were seeing 
uh, we're reading as kind of uh, recent, uh, recent shared ancestry of dogs with specific wolf populations weren't kind of uh, weren't indicators of this or origin population, but were actually post-divergence gene flow. So the origin population appears to be more ancient and from a population that's not, doesn't have any affinity to any of these branches. So we don't know, we don't know where it came from, but it was kind of before the geographical split of wolves. So that main question was left open, but at least we found that, uh, again, it's this complex history of gene flow between wolves and dogs that makes this problem very complex. And uh, another uh, really cool uh, analysis that we did uh, and published uh, last year is uh, this reanalysis of the Neanderthal genome that I'm going to talk a bit more about in my research talk. So I'm just going to give a very brief intro here. Um, so if you're not aware of this, we can now sequence DNA from uh, bones that are tens of thousands and even some several hundreds of thousands years old. And we can take DNA and sequence genomes. And some of these genomes are at high quality, as high quality as we can sequence from any of you today. So we can do a lot of the inference that we're used to doing on present day populations, now on these extinct populations, and we can learn very cool stuff. So uh, we did that on the data that was already published back in uh, 2016. There was a high coverage a Neanderthal genome and another high coverage genome from a closely related population, these Denisovans. I'm going to again talk in more detail about this uh, uh, in, in about a week and a half. Uh, so you're going to get all the details, but the main idea that I wanted to show here is that we're able to, uh, first of all, it's the first time people have been analyzing these data, but they, but you know, never, never tried to actually uh, infer uh, a kind of a unified demography for these extinct populations, and this is what we did here. So we see one thing that you see is that you see, in contrast to modern humans, uh, here represented by Yoruba, by, by West African populations, these archaic humans uh, have uh, kind of suffered from very small population sizes. This is kind of the width of these branches. And it, w it seemed to be kind of gradually decreasing as they split. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of genetic diversity there, and that might be related to, to at least some of the reasons why they weren't able to be as successful as our ancestors and uh, were maybe outcompeted by them as they um, expanded in Eurasia. So this is one thing you see, but the really cool stuff comes when you actually look at gene flow between these populations. So it was already established before our work then that there was quite a lot of gene flow from, uh, from these archaic uh, from Neanderthals and these Denisovans to uh, our ancestors that kind of split and expanded here in Eurasia. This is what you see here, all of these branches. But, and we see a lot of that in our analysis as well. But one thing that we saw, which was kind of surprising, is that we see also some earlier gene flow in the other direction that we associate with a branch that's not actually represented by any present day human population. So it's a branch that uh, is kind of more basal and probably got extinct, but it's more closely related to the modern kind of branch here than this. So it acted kind of as a bridge and allowed gene flow from our very great ancestors into the Neanderthal and the Nisivan branch. So I'm going to talk quite, li quite a bit about how we can find these signals in the genome and how we can be quite sure that something like this happened. And it's, as you can think, yeah. With this demography, we have some uh, explicit evidence for gene flow from our ancient origin into the Nisovans, right, by looking in the mitochondria. Is that something? So I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about that. So in the mitochondria, it's a very different story. It's actually, so people, f so there is also evidence. I'm not showing it here because it's kind of a simplified figure there is an additional archaic branch that seemed to have contributed to Denisovans. And we are able to show, so that, so 
I'm going to talk a bit more about that, but it, it is related to this, but the mitochondria is actually a different story. It seems that the Neanderthal mitochondria is probably uh, modern human mitochondria. It's the, the, the reason that Denisovans are an outlier is not because they got it from an, from an ancient uh, population, but probably because Neanderthals got their mitochondria from something, from something like this. That's what people think today. We, we can talk about it offline, but it's a very com there, are, there are even more branches here that I'm not showing, and it's pretty complicated. I'm, ho I'm hoping to convince you in my research talk that we can fairly confidently make these inferences and it, that it's not just stories kind of on a, on a one slide thing. But that's not for today. So these are a lot of the things that I'm uh, still doing. Um, but when I'm going to, how much time do I have? I don't, Anybody looking at the time? Hmm? Okay, yeah, so that's definitely enough, enough time. So what I want to talk more about uh, now that I have 10 minutes is something that I didn't put in any of my other talks, and it's something that we're doing now, and uh, I wanted to at least mention it. And this kind of a Fourier into trying to use these approaches to understand how natural selection might affect kind of how genealogies are uh, distributed along the genome. And this is through a study on uh, speciation. So uh, when species kind of emerge, when you see, here you see a kind of a, a figure where you have this ancestral population and then it splits into two separate populations and they kind of evolve separately. And what we know is that this, while we w want to think about this as an instantaneous event, it's actually pretty gradual event. So when populations split, and there are some cases where the split is very fairly instantaneous, where, the, where there's a clear geographical separation and they don't really interact. But in most cases, speciation, even after speciation, the species are kind of either, um, either very close to each other and still there is some migration, or actually within the same habitat, but the speciation is only generated by kind of uh, adapting to different niches in that, in that region. So they always have the opportunity to exchange genes. Uh, so we, can't, we have to kind of consider this uh, continuing gene flow at least for a certain time. And the nice thing that ha kind of, the, I think the interesting question here is that how, so, so we think about this process as, as kind of some continuing gene flow for a certain amount of time. And then at some point, these two separate populations become too diverged for them to exchange genes. So, so at this point here, uh, the individuals down here, individuals down here, where they might be able to share some genes, their, their offspring are not going to be, uh, their fitness is going to be too reduced and they're going to be kind of selected out of the population. And we're interested in kind of understanding how this process happens. We, we, there are some signs that show that it's not completely gradual, that there is something kind of directing this halting of gene flow between uh, speciating groups. So this is a study, there are a lot of this, so in the past, in the past I'd say five years, since people are able to create genome-wide sequence data from, you know, their species of interest, they've been trying to look at this question of speciation on, on ver a lot of kind of different uh, types, of, uh, uh, types of species. Here you see a very cool study uh, by uh, Bellingham et al. Uh, published this year uh, about Heliconius butterflies. So each plot here shows a pair of populations. So you see it's one butterfly, but it's actually two. You see different patterns left and right. So it's a comparison between two different uh, species or subspecies of Heliconius butterfly. And here you see plotted our FST values along the genome. So FST, if you're not, uh, if you don't know about um, kind of is a very basic population genetic measure that tries to capture uh, genetic uh, differentiation between two groups. And as you see, it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem very uniform. So overall, there seems to be kind of a reasonable distribution of FST values, but then every now and then you see this very distinct peak of uh, a region that's very much more differentiated 
than others, and people kind of tend to think about these regions as what's called putative islands of speciation. Now they're called islands of divergence because we don't necessarily know whether they are you know, involved directly in speciation, but the idea is that divergence between population doesn't start kind of uniformly along the genome, but it starts at certain loci where there might be genes so this is where you want to make the distinction between islands of speciation or islands of divergence. So at first people thought that they might be actually genes that promote speciation. Once you have divergence there, then you know your uh, two populations can't hybridize as efficiently as before, and then they're kind of uh, um, doomed to diverge uh, independently once these loci have diverged. So now we're not entirely sure whether they have kind of this active role in speciation, but it's clear that these loci in, in different, you see here in different pairs, they are the first to get to be diverged. And we want to understand how, what makes, you know, what causes this process. So this project we're involved in is a collaboration with uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, and they sequenced a bunch of uh, bird species. Uh, they have two groups. Here I'm showing this Sporophylla uh, seed eater cappuccinos from the Amazon forest. And you see here these different species, or they're, they're probably not, I don't know if you can call them species, but let's say subspecies. And this is, uh, you can see here, uh, uh, there are kind of zones on, in the Amazon drawn in the map. And you see there's quite a lot of overlap. And we do see when we look at, you know, their genomes, we, so now we have their genome sequenced, we do see quite a lot of evidence of gene flow. So, so genetically, they seem to be kind of in the process of speciation. But when you look at it, it's hard to see maybe in the resolution. But I think you still see that they have very, at least their male, uh, their males are very, very different. So even though they're not fully speciated genomically, they are able to generate very different kind of plumage patterns among males. And so visibly, when you look at them in the field, they're very, their males are very, very clearly distinct. Females are not so much. And this might be, for instance, in birds, this plays a very important role uh, because there is, uh, you know, the females select the males based on their plumage. And if you have now very distinct subpopulations of, uh, that, of birds that look differently, then you're going to start to have this separation into, sp into species. So we're interested in understanding what role uh, plumage patterns have in bird speciation. So we, we already have these genome sequences, and we can do this basic FST computation here for two of these groups. And we see something very similar to what other people see in other recently speciated groups, uh, generally low patterns of FST. And then you see these peaks, these putative islands of divergence, let's call them, because we don't necessarily know whether they related to speciation. And some of them, at least in you know, our a kind of very preliminary result, it's not even published yet, is that we see that at least there is an enrichment here to uh, regions that seem to be associated again with, uh, here are melanocytes uh, that are responsible in the synthesis of uh, femalalanin in uh, kind of the yellow patterns in, in the bird feathers. So we do see some association with these uh, peaks of divergence with things having to do with plumage colors. So, you know, there is kind of uh, circumstantial evidence of the, the role of these early divergence loci with uh, plumage patterns, but uh, what we're now trying to do is trying to go beyond FST. And the problem is with FST, there's growing evidence that FST is not a very good measure to do these types of things because it's very sensitive to demographic, like if there is a, uh, if there is a fairly strict uh, reduction in population size, that's going to tend to increase FST. And kind of population size is not something that's constant along the genome. And I'm not going to get into that here. But some loci are going to be affected more than others. And people have shown that this leads at least to some of these divergence peaks might be related to artifacts. And they, they're not really highly diverged. And we think, so 
our idea in going into this research is that if you think about the genealogies, if you don't try to just look at the sequence patterns as they are, but you can, you're going to try, if you're going to try to infer these genetic genealogies going along the genome, then that really helps you in trying to find the patterns that you're looking for. You're going to want to look at genealogies, for instance, where you see a lot of these crosses. That's where you have a lot of gene flow. And then you might see genealogies where you see very few crosses. These might be indications of divergence, of separation, where you don't really see a lot of lineages crossing. So if you try to frame the problem you're interested in, in terms of the genealogy, we think that's going to really help this whole field of, of looking at recently speciated uh, groups. Uh, so just to finish, uh, kind of a, a brief intro to my kind of lab. So this is what we're, we're interested in, these kind of everything spanning from genomes, genealogy, and evolution. Uh, we're interested in the theory, also developing actual software for people to be able to use. We're, we're devoting a lot of time for that and data analysis. And again, the, 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 the final thing is that we really want to use all of this to learn something interesting about evolution. These are uh, people, uh, students and programmers and research analysts in my group. And well, I'd be happy to talk to more of you during the breaks and et cetera, about a lot of these things. And thanks. Questions? I have one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, alternative analysis you proposed in the last slide. Yeah. Uh, so will it help you to, uh, to address this? So I guess what we're looking for is not only how uh, speciation goes in terms, in terms of population uh, history, but mm -hmm. we're also looking for what, like, the, the genome. The triggers, so that's my, yeah, exactly. Speciation. Yeah. Yeah, so what we, so conceptually what we're trying to do is trying to kind of, uh, trying to go along the genome and try to infer, where you can't really infer this arg along the genome, but you can try to infer um, properties of the arg. So we want to define the property that's kind of correlated with regions that might have this excess in diverge, divergence. So FST is a, the basic thing that you want to do, but if we want to try to frame FST in a genealogical kind of okay. way. So FST is probably not what you want. Yeah, so we, if, but if you look at the genealogy, then you can, so if you actually reconstruct the genealogy, you can, I think, address a lot of these artifacts that affect so FST and, and not. Try to sort of identify regions where the coalescence is Asian, ancient yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes? Don't you lose a lot of information about it because the genealogy you have from the sequence? You have it from the sequence. So in the end, you basically just look at the sequence. Yeah, but the idea... You guide yourself using the genealogy. No, but the idea... So, so the idea is to create a summary. So FST is also a summary of the sequence. We think FST is kind of too low dimensional. We want to create a summary of the sequence using the genealogy that is more related to what people are actually looking for. The genealogy from the yeah. But basically what I'm asking, essentially what you're saying is the FST is not a good measure. You're looking for a different measure of the sequence that's yeah. going to be guided by the, the Right, genealogy. yeah. So this is just the intuition. That's because exactly. It's just the sequence. It's yeah. It's 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 a function of the sequence, but it's a different function of the sequence. And so the genealogy is a, is a mode of thinking, right? It's just, for me at least, it helps you kind of frame the type of thing that you're looking for. When you're thinking about FST, a lot of people think actually about the genealogy. You're trying to look for places where your two populations are, are set more separate kind of than you would expect. So you think about it in the way the tree is kind of separate. But eventually, you, you, you use a summary that actually only looks, it's a site-wise summary that you just average in a big block. We think that you can actually get more by explicitly thinking about the genealogy and pooling also, pooling also better information from you know, nearby sites and not just averaging a site-wise sequence so measure. Try just to think about the sequence, because FST is also thinking about the genealogy. Right? Yeah. Taking the sequence and going to basically to the question that you're asking, would 
without thinking about anything else in the middle, just like thinking about... So what people are doing now is FST or... <laughs> but what, basically what people are doing in this field are, is using, so they might be using different methods, but they're usually using a site-wise measure, FST or what's called DXY or whatever, or heterozygosity, but it's measured per site and then they average it in a block. What we think you, that you can do, genealogies are not independent across sites, and you can use this correlation to actually understand for a given block of interest, kind of get the information you're really interested in in a statistically right way. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Yeah. Okay, thanks again.